Hello to the Chicas as well as the Chicos. We are going to go back to No Die Classics and I'm going to present to you an amazing story. A story that is uh, very well known. It has been written about in various blogs, news articles, uh, even lecture videos, you name it. It's a very, very fascinating uh, story and uh, a very good uh, depiction of uh, what professional chess used to look like pre-computer era and a lot of us actually can't even imagine that such thing existed because many of us uh, actually were born um, when the computer chess already dominated the arena but the older one of us definitely do remember the times when computers were just uh, sort of opening their wings but not quite ready to fly yet and uh, so most of the analysis and the home preparation really and truly meant home preparation. And I'm going to take you back uh, almost 70, in fact more than 70 years, and we are going to land in 1955 um, in a beautiful Scandinavian city called Gothenburg. And uh, we are going to look, you would never guess, the history of the fascinating Gothenburg variation, which is a variation in the Sicilian night off, which uh, is probably uh, one of the greatest disaster of uh, uh, in the history of Argentinian chess. So I guess uh, that goes along the same day or on the same level with the day when uh, Diego Maradona retired from soccer. Well, this is the equivalent in chess. So what happened on that very, very not so beautiful day from an Argentinian point of view is that Three Argentinian grandmasters, Nidov, Pano and Pilnik, all got drawn black against three um, Russian, or I should rather use actually the word Soviet grandmasters, Gela, Keres and Spassky, the young Spassky back then. And um, they really wanted to come up with something new. They really wanted to surprise the very fearsome Soviet grandmasters. And they just had a break day, a free day before round 14, and Grandmaster Pilnik came up with an idea which he was hoping to use um, against Keres' novelty of Bishop H4. So there were times when F6 got taken here and Bishop H4 was a novel to play it earlier on. And the Argentinians were struggling against it. And then Pilnik came up with this idea which, despite of its relative value, I have to say that the idea is a genius. And in fact, it's quite often seen in other variations of the Sicilian too. But back then in the 50s, to come up with that idea against the most feed grandmasters of the world took, um, yes, yeah, serious courage, just to stay politically correct. Um, yeah, the cojones that this required is, is just next level. So uh, they spent a rock solid 24 hours analyzing this like mad trying to find a hole and they couldn't and so the Argentinian delegation or rather the bunch of GMs present decided that they will all try their luck and all the three of them would play the same variation should it occur on the board and as luck would have it indeed it did occur so the first game we are looking at is uh, Geller Panno and the reason why I'm choosing to sh show you this because Geller was the first one to work out the refutation. So all the three of them had to figure out what the refutation was, although there are rumors that make this story truly fascinating, that there were ginormous demonstration boards over the players' heads, which was absolutely traditional and very commonplace back then when um, chess competitions were held in a theater and there would be thousand, even 2,000 uh, spectators present. So those are the times in terms of chess and so they technically could see what was going on on the other boards by just taking a peek at the demonstration boards now i'm not even hinting they did but the possibility was there so gala definitely deserves the credit for coming up with the correct well let's even talk about that later so gala took knight d7 the idea is uh, of the whole variation is to force the f pawn away from the e5 square so that black can create a beautiful blockade on e5 with a magnificent knight there and then hoping to recuperate the pawn and have a really awesome position 
And so Geller here came up with this absolutely killer idea of sacking the knight for the sake of exposing the king here. But here he needed to pull out another bunny from the hat and he did. And boy, this move is just a fabulous demonstration of how imaginative and how really powerful the Soviet grandmasters of the time were. Like they, he just plays bishop b5 here and you just go like, what am I even watching? And it's such a beautiful move. The idea is very simple, castles and mate on f7, but for that I could have put the bishop virtually on any square on the diagonal, except for a5 because that's not on that diagonal, even on a6. But b5 has two very clever points to it. Predominantly one, the main one is, is that after knight uh, e5, which is uh, the text move, oopsie daisies, what have I done here? Oh, never mind, I'm in the wrong uh, window. Sorry, bear with me. Uh, same story. Da, 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 da. I've got too many windows open, and that doesn't help. So, bishop b5, and the main idea about this move is, is that after knight e5, well first and foremost the queen can't go to e8 to the rescue, but more importantly, or equally importantly, after bishop g3, which is just mwah, loving it, plan eliminate the knight, castles and mate on f7, black can't play either of these moves. I mean, this is just breathtaking that if knight c6 i just butchered the knight i butchered the knight and i checkmate you thank you very much on your bike which i can't really no uh, say uh in russian it would be really awesome if i could speak some russian because on your bike i'm pretty sure would be a pretty impressive expression so boy Geller needed to come up with this over the board and frankly this move doesn't have any value unless you see this because nothing else really works and so the um, the Gala match, the Gala game um, against Panno went knight e5, bishop g3, bishop takes g5, and from here on it's just a downhill. Castles, king e7, bishop takes e7, uh, e5, and essentially black is done here because the recapture is impossible owing to check, rook check picking off at least a queen and even queen b6 check doesn't save the day because after king h1 takes we just invade via queen f7 king d6 rook check and now mate is inevitable the prettiest one probably is this whoa not bad eh and then check uh, king key check king key checkmate Rumor has it, it's not really healthy to go on an excursion and a long walk with a king. So that was it, boys. That was Gela refuting, or so we think, thought, um, the Gothenburg variation by this fabulous knight sack takes check and then bishop b5. But of course, this is just one third of the story, or rather one quarter, if you really want to be accurate, because then... Keres, who plays the Argentinian legend Nidov, and by the way, for the record, at the time, in 1955, these Grandmaster trio, Nidov, Pano and Pilnik, were really high up in the world, and this was an interzonal competition, which meant that that was basically a way for them uh, to get into the uh, world champion candidates. So the, the stakes were high, everyone played their absolute best chess, preparation was on point and uh yeah this was just real real massive stuff i mean think about it glikoric one of the greatest grandmasters of his era in the 50s was there as a, a journalist i actually don't know the reason why but he he may have played i don't know i will have to look it up shame on me for not knowing this what is for certain is that glikoric was there to write articles for various newspapers I'm absolutely certain that the keyboard warriors are already looking up whether Gligorich was there or not. I don't want to nay, ruin the video with that, but uh, mark my words is that Gligorich did write articles for various newspapers about the interzonal in Gothenburg, and you will see the reason why I'm mentioning this. Back to Keres. Keres also smashes out the same variation on the very same day, on the very same tournament hall, and also finds knight takes e6, and also finds bishop b5. 
Now, once again, I would not like to enter the debate whether he just looked up on the uh, demo boards and were like, whoa, that looks like my position. Bishop b5, EFM, good boy, well done, I shall do that too. Don't know. I think uh, Keres was definitely, I mean, in the 50s, he was just a boss. Um, he definitely could have worked it out, and uh, if I had to put money on it, I would say he did. Uh, Bishop b5, his game went king g7. Castles 95, identical, essentially, to the previous one. Bishop g3, and uh, he fell apart here too, and the last two games will be identical in this regard. Knight g6, the refutation is just mint. Picture perfect. Takes h6, rook takes and rook h7, check. Decoying the king from the rook. And now this g6 knight is just an awful piece. So after the check, it's definitely going to drop. And the attack is not going to ever stop. Check. King e8. Please note that against bishop f6, um, we have the check still. And after king e check, uh, pieces keep on dropping like flies. So this is not particularly pretty. So... After queen h6, he took b5, check, and went on an excursion. Again, once again, not recommended. Queen g6, check, king d7, and rook f7. Boy, what a move. What a move, especially if you see the follow-up, which is truly, truly spectacular. Because right now, okay, we have a s kind of a threat, but nothing major. But the dude plays knight c6, and because of white still has a lot of pieces, or so he thinks, he just casually goes like, yeah, nah, what need that guy? <laughs> Absolutely surreal. And the, the beauty of it is, is that black essentially loses in most variations as a result of a very awkward zugzwang where nobody can play. And the main threat of whites is, amazingly, is to get a queen here. No joke. Like, there are some other threats, but this essentially is the main point. So, if we take, of course, things take a different turn, because then I go check, king back, king back. And, again, a very unique case where black is stuck for useful moves. Like, if I take on a2 now, then rook g7 is going to lead to a very, very awesome mate. King d7, check, here, check, and then queen g6 mate. Not bad. That's the threat. So in order to dodge this, if I go back here now, we just simply take on d5. And despite of being two pieces up, black is utterly, hopelessly lost. Again, uh, the pins and the, the blocked-in pieces are just a really a tragic sight. An absolutely tragic sight uh, from uh, black's point of view. So the torture was real. Knight d5. I mean, if that lands on your board and your name is Miguel Naidov, one of the best grandmasters outside of the Soviet Union, hmm, that's, that's rough, man. That's rough. H4, as per predicted. Queen back to e7. And after queen g5, we can just go like, yeah, nah, it was embarrassing enough. Let's call it quits. After queen d8, uh, I can take b5. I don't see anything wrong with just uh, running the pawn in. But uh, the computer wants to check down the rook, and I can't really blame it for wanting to do that. And just as well, uh, at this point, um, neither threw in the towel here. Oh, sorry, I'm lying here. So, that was Keras Nidorf. There comes the 15-year-old Spassky, who we knew already a thing or two about chess. And ta-da, once again, same day, same tournament hall, same time, same everything. And he finds the whole shebang too. Knight takes e6, check, bishop b5, king g7. Same as previous game, knight e5, bishop g3. Once again, beautifully delivering the point of bishop b5. Denying again the knight's development and queen e8 as well. Just breathtakingly awesome. And goes in for the same story. Da, 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 all the way. Identical stuff. He plays h3. I very strongly disagree with that. But then again, it's a bit funny if I disagree with a dude who later on becomes a world champion. But the finish again is nearly identical. He drops the check though so that this doesn't win the rock. But even this doesn't save the die because of... Ouch. Ouchie. Beautiful check and uh, just mopped up the whole board, Spassky, and 
see you later, alligator. And the story could end here, but it won't because um, I still have a little bit to add to it. Remember how I mentioned to you Grigorich writing about this whole line? There is a rumor that Fischer, the very young Bobby Fischer at the time, uh, actually discussed briefly this uh, variation with Grigorich, and Grigorich just shrugged, shrugged his shoulders saying that, yeah, I don't know too much about this whole Gothenburg variation. And then comes the surprise because the next thing we know is that Bobby as black, Bobby Fischer against Gligorich has the same position. Now we don't really know a very famous Bobby Fischer game where he went down in the Gothenburg variation, right? Right. Reason for that? Because Bobby has found the move in 1955 that computers considered to be the best in 2020. Now that is how you know when you see a genius, when they come up with Rook H7 in a blink of an eye to refute an entire variation because that refutes everything from what we know today about this line. This Rook H7 uh, move actually refutes the 96 Bishop B5 idea to the extent that there is no more than a draw available for white. Bobby's game was quite hairy, and in fact, I messed it up with analysis, so I don't even know if it's right. Yeah, this is it. Uh, opening theory considers uh, castles, king, g8, g6, uh, rook, g7 best. I will show you that in a second. Bobby's game went like this. Um, Gligorich playing white. Um, Bobby recovered a fair bit of material, so now it's three pieces for the... Uh, three pawns for the pieces. But the pawns are really irrelevant. The reason why the position is more or less in balance, although black is definitely to be favored here, is uh, because of the king is very insecure. The game ended up in a draw, but as far as I'm concerned, black has the upper hand. And in fact, had it all the way to the very end. And they actually agreed, and I'm sorry for breezing through it, but there is not much point in analyzing it now. They agreed on draw here. I definitely wouldn't have agreed to draw here unless time pressure was on or competition results and, you know, depending on where we are in the comp, um, justified the decision. And now I need to show you the actual real line. So the line that we consider to be the best nowadays is um, Bishop B5, Rook H7, Castles. King g8, g6, and again, brace yourself for some absolutely mind-blowing business here. Rook g7, rook f7. Like, why is just playing moves as if there were 75 pieces on the board and just, hey, yeah, whatever, that's just a bishop, take it. I already sacked the knight, another bishop is hanging, no worries. But then again, black is playing with this, right? So, technically, we can afford to be generous. Take, 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 check. Um, the other move I saw here was rook f1, and I will show you that in a second. So this is where it fizzles into a draw. Uh, white can try to win here with rook f1, but after queen b6 checking h1, the draw is still the best that uh, either side can hope for. Rook mate is threatened instantly. Not bad. And taking the bishop loses very quickly to queen g8 and then rook f7 mate. So the only move is queen, uh, king d8. And then after bishop c4, it's just like, once again, unreal. Um, the two pieces down for nothing, and we're just casually pulling the bishop back, hoping to take this knight d5 and back rank mate. And the best black, best black has against this is knight here, bishop takes knight e7 to cover the upcoming knight d5. Check, we pick off h4, we pick off e7. And uh, the position again fizzles into a very drawish, equally position. But this is not my favorite line. My favorite line is actually check here. Because this allows white to play for a win. And I believe that there was a game by Grandmaster Chava Bolog, which I was too lazy to look up, uh, in the Dubai Open in about 2006, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where he won a game against, uh, I can't remember who it was, I think one of the Georgian GMs with uh, this e5 move. But uh, this is still a draw. Knight e4, queen check again, and the king again goes for a walk. And that's the only saving grace. 
after check, king d6 is actually losing, king d8 is the draw. And the way it's a draw is check, here, check, here, check. Absolutely surreal that this draws the game, right? If I go here, knight e4 and mate, see you later, alligator. And if I go in this position, um, hang on a second. So if I go king d6 here, that also loses to the spectacular knight e8 check, denying the king's retreat to c7. And after king c5 is probably better because queen king c6 is strongly met by... Okay, I have to show you this. <laughs> oh boy. Now that is a mate that you would definitely write a postcard home about to every single relative of yours across the globe. Probably even to those who are not related to you, because if you want a game like this, you've done it all. But even this uh, can't conclude our session, because we know now that Fisher is a genius, and he figured out how to save the day for black. But the reality is that we can safely say that all this whole thing was a storm in a teacup. Well, apart from the fact that the Argentinian Grandmasters got a very nasty whooping uh, from their fellow Soviet uh, chess friends. <laughs> yeah, what a phrase of, uh, what a way to put that, right? Chess friends, chess friends usually don't do this to you. Bang, that's not chess friends, that's chess frenemies. But, turns out, that A, the whole line is just a draw, and B, there is no need to be flashy at all with knight e6, because the very common, not so quiet, queen h5, pinning the pawn and hitting this like mad guarantees white a very very substantial advantage. The point is that after knight e5 we don't go back to g3 which would be more or less the logical con uh, continuation but to f2. And the reason behind this move is, is because black has to take on g5 with the bishop and so having the bishop on g3 would mean that when we castle here we face this ugly. Whereas now we simply play bishop e2, bishop d7, castles here, and uh, the tension is getting real. Knight d1, rook d1, tension is getting real there too. And uh, black is in significant struggle town to find a constructive plan. It's sturdy, the position is difficult to break, but black doesn't have a good plan. There is no good way to engage and to do something for black here. A4 is a good move to even shut B5 down. And uh, yeah, I can't stress it enough. Optically, it's looking holdable for black, but it's ridiculously far, uh, hard to find a sensible constructive plan. I quite like for white, by the way, queen h3, bishop h5, replacing the attacker on f7, causing even more difficulties. So. Obviously, this is far more lame to play like this, but um, that seems to be the best way to go. So that was the fascinating story of the Gothenburg variation, which involved multiple, multiple chess legends and uh, a really, really unique story where in the same tournament hall, three different games, six grandmasters, featured the exact same opening variation with the supposed refutation and led to an extreme wipeout. What a story. Those were the days, guys. Those were the days. And on that note, I will let you go now, and uh, I will catch in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.